person would have had to be really light to go up that ladder and not make noise. And that is why I'm saying this child did not come down that ladder. Maybe they actually... Welcome to Seeing Dead People, the mystery storytelling podcast with a clairvoyant twist. Radio Sydney presents Seeing Dead People, Episode 15, Who Kidnapped Baby Lindbergh? Hello, Darcy. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? <laughs> I'm pretty peachy, Darcy. Thanks. Um, today, we're going to tackle, Darcy, one of the most famous criminal cases in U.S. history, and certainly the most famous event in the early 20th century, and I'm very interested to know your reactions to what we're going to be experiencing today. To say this was a big case would be like saying Jeff Bezos has a little dough. The family affected included the most famous hero of, a, of the time, an heiress to a huge fortune, and their firstborn and beloved child. One journalist called it the greatest story since the resurrection. A bit of an exaggeration, obviously, but it ranks up right up there with the biggest criminal cases in the 20th century, definitely on par with the O.J. Simpson trial. This is a case where more than one guilty person was involved, but only one guilty person paid the price. Since the case is so well known, I'm not going to focus too much on hiding the specifics from you, Darcy. Instead, we're going to see if you can identify not just the individual who paid the ultimate price, but other guilty parties if indeed co-conspirators actually existed. So, Darcy, if I told you our family trio consists of the 20th century's most famous aviator, his millionaire heiress wife, and their 20-month-year-old first child, are you starting to zero in? I am. Are you? Who do you think we're talking about? Well, the only child I can think of at that time frame would be the Lindbergh baby. Exactly. Well done, Darcy. Okay. Well, you're right. Our male, our male lead is Colonel Charles Lindbergh, the famous U.S. aviator who had flown the first solo flight across Atlantic, the Atlantic Ocean in 1927. Our female lead is his wife, heiress, aviator herself, poet and author in her own right, Anne Spencer Morrow. Her father, Dwight Morrow, was one of the richest men in New Jersey at the time. So let's get to know the Lindberghs a little bit, Darcy. Please have a look at the first three photos, one, two, and three. All of the happy couple, dating from 1929, which is the year they were married, to early 1932, the year our story takes place. So what do you see in this happy, accomplished, and famous young couple, Darcy? Well, I would say very striking couple. Yeah. Um, very determined. Uh, there's a... A blue connection between them, and when I say that, it's the energy you can feel between them, and they give me goosebumps looking at them. So I would have said they were in love. Oh, nice. You've never said that before. Nope. And adventurous. Yep. I, I think both of them were open to doing, especially when they had no children, mm-hmm. to, to exploring the world. Yeah, well, in, in, in photo number two, they're in the airplane, aren't they? Yes, they are. And they're both aviators, amazingly enough, flying around in these dinky little airplanes in the the late 1920s. And um, I would say Anne was probably close to her mom. They definitely have a resemblance in photograph number three. Yes, in photo number three, we have her parents with them, don't we? Yes. Um, but again, it seems like a nicely knit family. Yep. Uh, I'm not feeling any any sense of antagonism between her parents and Charles. So I would think that in their eyes, maybe she did well in her marriage. Okay. Well, he was really uh, a pretty famous guy. Yeah. But if, I, I'm not 100% sure it was love at first sight, but they definitely... There is a love affair here. Oh, that's nice. And you, you're finding that because you're seeing the color blue between them. Yes. Wow. That's, a, that's a, the first time you've mentioned that as, as, a, as a sense that you have. I didn't uh, know that. That's cool. I don't always get it, but they, it was this really warm, fuzzy feeling that I picked up at first. 
and then there's this blue color in between them, which means that they've come together for a reason. Okay. And also, just this feeling of energy that the two of them basically loved each other. Oh, that's nice. Well, they are pretty serious in the first three photos, Darcy, but have a look at photo number four. Finally, we get a shot where they're both smiling. Yes. And, and so that, me, this is, like, there's a two-year difference between the first photo yep. and this one, and, or is it three years? Three years. Yep. And there's even more energy between the two of them, like, what's that old expression, we're on the hunt? Yep. Okay, that's what I feel, like, that, that excitement. And I'm leaning more towards the British feel, of maybe exploring the world yeah here. okay um, were they due to have a child here too well this is the the actual uh, date of this specific photograph i don't know but i do know it's 1932 and i do know it was early in the year and you'll know why i know that because they wouldn't be smiling a couple of months from now um, but uh, i would say uh, they have a child they would already have had the child okay so yeah, because I've only, I've gone down by photo by photo. I'm trying not to skip ahead. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, well then we'll move on to, tragically, this idyllic marriage. And as you say, it does seem to be idyllic. It will soon be tested beyond measure. On March the 1st, 1932, so therefore sometime, I think, after this picture with them smiling, um, their first child, baby Charles Lindbergh Jr., aged only 20 months, have been stolen from his second floor nursery between 8.30 p.m. and 10 p.m. in Hopewell near Princeton, New Jersey. His parents were downstairs having dinner. His nurse, Betty Gow, checked and the baby was fine at 8.30 p.m. But when she returned an hour and a half later, she was horrified to find the bed was empty. So let's have a look at our dear little baby Charles in photo number five, and then an illustration of him on the cover of Time magazine in photo number six. What do you see in those photos, Darcy? Well, a very cute, happy little boy. Yeah. Um, and obviously as a child, not a lot of care in the world. <laughs> no. Um, but I just feel like... Well, as any child, there's so much potential around them. Mm -hmm. I, I don't feel like he was a sick child or anything. No, I think he was very healthy. Oh, yeah. Um, and, yeah, loved. That's the word I would say for him. He was definitely loved. Yeah. He wanted. You know, there's a lot of children during that time frame that even though they came into the world, their parents were so stressed. Right. But this kid was loved. Yeah. Yeah, he looks... Very, he's got his toys. He's got yeah. uh, a really happy little expression. He's well dressed, well fed, plump little guy. Yeah, he is. And all that curly hair. Yeah, and curly hair, exactly. Okay, well, now we unfortunately we get to the sad part of the story. Would you check out uh, photo number seven, which is the wanted flyer poster, which was really released immediately after the kidnapping? Could you read us what the flyer says and whether you have any sense of uh, anything beyond that? Well, it's wanted. Um, information at the whereabouts of Chaz A. Lindbergh, Jr., son of Colonel Chaz A. Lindbergh, uh, world-famous avi aviator. Mm -hmm. uh, this child was kidnapped from his home in Hopewell, New Jersey, between 8 and 10 p.m. Okay, I'm going to argue with the time. On Tuesday, March 1st, 1932. Okay. Uh, description, age 20 months, weight 27 to 30 pounds, height 29 inches, hair blonde curly, eyes dark blue, complexion light, deep dimple in center chin, dressed huh. in one piece coverall night suit. Right. And then they have that who to contact. Right. Okay. I know they're saying 8 to 10 p.m. Yeah. But I feel like it's more like 6 to 9 p.m. Now, why do you think that? Because supposedly Betty Gow saw him at 8.30. I don't think so. Like, I, I keep feeling like I'm more likely closer to the 6 p.m. that this little boy went missing. And how are you getting a sense of time, Darcy? It, the, the, 
when I look at the 8 to 10, I feel nauseous. <laughs> I feel like this is wrong. I feel like he was gone before then, um, which makes me wonder, what was the name of the nurse? Betty Gow. Was she involved? Ah, well, that's something we will explore in a, a few minutes. Okay. Okay, well, that's interesting. You're feeling nauseous just reading the line between 8 and 10 p.m. Yep. Did you feel nauseous reading anything else in that statement? Nope, just <sighs> the 8 and 10 p.m. Oh, wow. You've got to be very uh, quick to pick up your feelings, don't you? I do. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll tell you a little bit about what happened. Muddy footprints led across from the window to the crib and back. The first handwritten ransom note was found in an envelope near the window. In fact, the sh there were no actual shoe prints, Darcy. They were footprints, literally. So there was a con wonder, did the kidnappers wear s only socks or were they wearing moccasins when they actually came in and took the boy? Um, a handmade ladder was found against the house wall below the nursery window, with a rung broken, as though someone climbing it had fallen through. So now for a bit of this evidence, Darcy, check out photo number eight. It shows the shot of the actual ladder outside the nursery window, two-story window, of Lindbergh's mansion. Uh, While you look... I'm so going to argue with this. Sorry? Um, the footsteps were plant, the baby was taken through the house. They did not take him down that ladder. Contrary, the ladder, this is not the right course of action. Really? Okay. Now that's a totally different perspective on what's considered historically happened. That's really interesting. No. Okay. Well, two sets of footprints led away from the ladder and they went to about 60 feet away and then they ran into a third set of footprints, a little smaller, so supposed to be possibly a woman. Then all three footprints uh, tracked back to the main highway about a kilometer from the house before disappearing. Of course, there was a massive panic, chaos, and searching of all the cars on the highways near the home and leaving the state of New Jersey. Now, you can just imagine the crime scene itself was a major gong show with police, neighbors, reporters, nosy parkers, even souvenir hunters swarming all over it. So, you of course know the outcome of the case, Darcy. We'll get to the details later. But what interests me is to use your talents to expand on the events of the kidnapping, the subsequent investigation, and most importantly, to discover more about who was involved, and you've already started to hint at that, that you disagree completely with the time the child was taken and how the child was taken. So... I do. Yeah, that's... I mean, this, this is going to be great. So let's talk then about the perpetrators. From the footprint evidence, it was obvious from inside two individuals took part in the baby snatching and possibly the one other who was on scene that we know of the smaller footprints. Since the baby was taken during what is considered to be between 8.30 to 10, during such a short time period, and both the maid slash nurse and parents were downstairs, an inside job was suspected, as you said. But I'm going to actually now show you headshots, Darcy, of three women who were involved in the kidnapping case in some way, okay? Before I reveal their identities and roles, I'm going to put you to the test and see if you can glean anything first from these three women. Because in particular, well, I want to know which one or ones were involved in the kidnap plot if you believed it was an inside job. So have a look at photo number nine. Tell us what this person looks like. Okay, just a minute. All right. Um... Sorry, I, That's okay. I, every time I hit, it just keeps going back to photo eight. <laughs> just one second. Oh, I have to hit done. All right. Well, this is a lady with a box hat on, or a pill hat, or whatever. Yeah, pill box. That's the right term. I couldn't remember it. Okay. And pretty. Yep. Um... I would think dark eyes by the looks of it. Mm-hmm. Wait, but they're not the same ladies, right? There are three separate ladies. There are going to be three separate ladies. This is lady number one. 
Okay, I'm not going to say anything until after we see all three of them. Okay. Okay. And then number 10. Yep. The photos are just generic in some aspects because they both have dark hair. Yep. Um, they both have, all the noses are different. Um, number 10, I'm on the fence about for a minute. You're what? Let me... I'm on the fence with number 10. Okay, and I apologize. There's a couple of gray smudges there, and that's because I wanted I had to remove her name from the photo. Okay. And number, which was the third lady, number 11? Number 11 is the third lady. Okay. She might be the housekeeper. Um, she looks like she's sort of blonde or gray. Yep. White eyes. Yep. Uh, she's wearing a hat as well. Yep. Huh, let me have a look. Yeah, so take some time and tell me what you think of these three ladies and if any of them was involved in the kidnapping. Well, the first one, number... Number nine? Nine. Yep. That, okay, I didn't... Wait, where did the number nine go? She's the one with the pillbox hat. Yes. Uh, is she... See, her and number 10 sort of look alike to me, and I'm, I, I'd be hard-pressed. But I'm leaning that this must be Betty, number 9. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, what, what were the other lady's names? Okay, well, then I will tell you uh, who they are, then, if you've got nothing else to say about them. Well, number 10, mm -hmm. I feel like she knows something. Okay. Like there's something maybe she never revealed. Okay. Okay. Right. Number eleven. Yep. She's she's a little scary. <laughs> it might be um, the might also be it's kind of a crappy photograph. Well, yeah, but she also has an energy around her that's a little scary. Okay. Number nine, I would say to you, just given her appearance, her doe-like appearance. Yep. That you know she's a doe caught in the headlight sort of idea. Yeah, she does look that that does shouldn't she? Yep. And number 10, I just feel like there's something she saw or thought she saw, but she didn't want to get someone in trouble. Okay. Okay. But, and number 11 reminds me of one of those governess, you know, that would scare the crap off of you if you did something <laughs> wrong. Yeah, yeah, she does have that look, doesn't she? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, then I shall tell you who the three are. So, number 9 is you are right that is betty gal she is the baby's nanny the baby's nurse whatever you want to call her she was the one who found little charles they say in his crib at 8 30 p.m all well uh the night he died or the night he disappeared i should say sorry and then discovered he was missing about an hour and a half later she was quickly ruled out as a suspect female number two number which is our photo number 10 is a gal named Violet Sharp. She was a servant in the Lindbergh house. And yes, she was under suspicion because her testimony was conflicting. Nothing was ever proved against Violet Sharp, but tragically, she eventually committed suicide. So she may well have known something, as you suggested, but didn't want to reveal it. No one knows why her testimony was conflicting and, and what, what, what she might have told, but she did commit suicide a few months later. Okay. Okay. With her. And um, then... I want to say she was threatened. You feel she was threatened? Yes. And are you still thinking that it was an inside job? Absolutely. Okay. Number three, female number three, which is our, our uh, kind of scary nanny-looking gal at, in photo number 11... She is the wife of a key player in this saga, and I'll reveal her identification a little bit later when we meet him, okay? Okay. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the ransom notes. Um, have a look at photo number 12, and it'll be very difficult for you to read the writing. So photo number 13 has a verbatim transcription of photo number 12, the, the first kidnapper's ransom letter for the Lindbergh baby. So have a look at the the original, and then read us out, if you don't mind, what's on uh, photo number 13, so we can all know what the man, woman, whomever wrote this note, what it said. Okay. 
Um, strangely enough, looking at the handwritten one, yep. if I'm correct, it says, Dear Sir, I have 50000 ready, 25 and 20 dollar bills, $50 bills, $10 bills, and $5 bills, and she, whoever it is, repeat themselves. Um, after two to four days, we will inform you of the deli- where to deliver the money. Yep. We warn you from waking, making, um, putting anything into the public for the notification. Mm-hmm. So this year, have 50000 ready, 25000 in 20 bills, 50, 10, 10,005 bills after two four days will inform you where to deliver the money. Mm-hmm. We warn you for making anything public or for notifying the police. The child is in, I guess that's supposed to be great care. Yep. Um, indication for all letters are signature and three holes. Right, and the, the, actually, uh, the note itself is obviously misspelled and has grammatical errors in it, and I've highlighted those in red on that number 13 photo that you've just read. Um, And they use the dollar sign after the numbers, which is is indicative that the the native, the writer is not a native English speaker. No, because, and that's why I was saying I felt something about Britain, because when you do 50 pounds, you put the pounds behind the 50. Exactly, and that's a that's a pretty standard European approach to uh, writing currency. Yeah. Um, you'll notice when you had said near the bottom, the child is in good care. Uh, yeah. Gut is actually German for kind and caring, good care. Yeah. Okay. Actually, it is German. Yeah, it's a, well, that's that becomes a possibility, and then you'll see the kind of weird smudge at the bottom of number twelve. There's a, a bizarre little, looks like almost a moon with a bunch of phases of the moon. Yeah. Well, if you go to photo number 14, you'll actually see a close-up. That is the what they call the signature, which they misspelled in their note. This is the signature of the, of the kidnappers. It's a red circle. The black circles, the small black dots, are actually holes in the paper, Darcy. And then the blue... A larger uh, clear circle uh, like uh, outline circles and then these weird little squiggles that was the signature that was to be seen on future notes oh, oh that's what they meant by three holes yes exactly is this um is this code well it could very well be code it's it's a very bizarre signature i mean it's not even it's not even letters. It's a circles, colors, and holes. Yeah. And I don't think anyone ever figured it out. Well, that is it's definitely unique. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. So, have they, you know, who... It almost, too, reminds me of Luna. Well, that's what I think. It looks like the phases of the moon, doesn't it? Yeah. On the actual paper itself. But I think that's an indication of how poorly this, how poor this photograph is. Because when you go to photo number 14, those circles that look like lunar phases in the original are actually full circles on the one that they show as this is what the signature really looked like. Okay. So it still could be lunar or solar or something, because it is something sun-like in the middle, bright red, and then these big rings around it. Yes. Yeah, there's nobody made any, as far as I know, there was never any sense made of this signature. Was there any connection to, okay, so I'm really bad when the wars occurred, um, to the war? I don't think so. So this is between wars. This is 1932. So we haven't got the Second World War yet, and we've finished off the First World War in the teens. So as far as we know, nothing overt anyway, war-wise. Okay. You're getting a hint of that? Yeah, either, either it has something to do with, or someone who's liked in the war. Okay, well that's certainly possible, because most men, I would have thought, of any age, you know, adult-wise, might have been in the Great War. Okay. Okie doke. Well, of course. You know what? What? Looking at this, at this, 
that where it has uh, where the, to deliver the money. Yep. When I looked at the way they wrote the uh, the money, the why. Yep. I'm almost thinking it's a woman who wrote this. Well, and that's interesting. I don't know what sort of handwriting analysis was done in those days. It'd be fun to have somebody doing it today, and maybe there are people who are investigating this on their own time anyway, to see what uh, kind of handwriting is that. Is it male handwriting, female? I've never really believed that Sherlock Holmes thing that you can always tell, but maybe handwriting experts can. You can't because if you have met my grade nine teacher, she told me I work. I wrote like a man. Well, see, there you go. <laughs> so, but you're saying you get a sense that a female might have written this. Yes. Okay. Well, that's certainly possible because we believe, at least from what we've just discussed the last few minutes, there were at least three people involved, and one was thought to be a woman. That's only because the thing, the footprints were smaller. My tendency to believe is. Uh, a woman would be better to be the one to actually pick up the child and carry it out because the child would be less threatened, I think, by a woman than by a man, but I don't really know. Yes, and the child wouldn't have made as much noise. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought so, right? I would have thought a child would be more comfortable when a, when a woman picked him up. Yeah. Okay, well, of course, all hell broke loose when this happened. And the president, the Bureau of Investigation, which was not yet called the Federal Bureau of Investigation, various police forces all got involved, and even the gangster Al Capone, from his jail cell, ponied up $10,000 in reward money, which is about 180000 today, to help out. Some people thought it was the mob taking the child. Lindbergh himself chose to negotiate with the kidnappers himself, not with the police, and broadcast a message on NBC radio promising confidentiality in the baby's safe return. A $75,000 ransom was offered for the safe return of the child, $50,000 was provided by the Lindbergh family, and $25,000 by the state of New Jersey. So in today's money, that's an astonishing $1.4 million that they offered, which during the Depression would have been an enormous amount of money. On March the 5th, so the baby was taken on March the 1st, so four days later, Lindbergh receives a second handwritten note, which in part said, Don't be afraid about the baby. Two ladies keeping care of it day and night. The letter then warned Lindbergh to keep the police out of the case, and it was spelled, case was spelled C A C E, so it was misspelled, and that another note will follow with more instructions. Days went by, and finally on March the 8th, so now we're seven days after the little boy has been kidnapped. One of the most puzzling and bizarre twists in this story occurs. A 72-year-old retired principal named Dr. John F. Condon, known to nobody in the investigation, put himself into the fray by publishing a letter to the kidnappers in a local paper, offering to help and swearing to never betray the kidnappers. So, Darcy, have a look at photos 15 and 16 of John Condon. Tell us what you think of our pushy principal. Well, you know, that old thing about... <clears throat> being in the limelight for 15 minutes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, that's partly. Plus, I know he was also thinking of getting a story out of this. Yeah. He wanted to make a name for himself. Yeah, pretty despicable, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But if I look at him, I could honestly say, yeah, he didn't take the child. He did not? No. Okay, so he was not involved in the kidnapping. No, this is more about the limelight for him. Yeah, and he sure got the limelight, Darcy. Now, Ama he wanted. <laughs> he got what? Yeah, he got what he wanted. Remarkably, the next day, the kidnapper responds to him with another grammatically challenged note stuffed in Condon's mailbox, telling him to get the money from Lindbergh and await further instruction. Doesn't say instructions, instructions. So it's not plural. Now this. Already terrifying and bizarre case gets even darker, more convoluted and disturbing. There follows many false starts, a couple of sus suspects who don't pan out, and then some emotionally charged and shadowy meetings and negotiations in cemeteries between Condon and a guy who became nicknamed Cemetery John. 
eventually, Condon received baby Charles's gray wool onesie, night suit that he was wearing, as proof of his life, and he paid Cemetery John $50,000 while Lindbergh Sr. was in a car nearby. Now, the police and Lindbergh had worked together about the ransom, and the notes were cash and gold certificates. All numbers were recorded by the police. The gold certificates were particularly important because they were being decirculated within two years as a currency, and thus you couldn't really hoard them beyond two years because you had to use them or they would be worthless. Cemetery John, getting his $50,000, claimed to Condon that the child would be found on a boat named Nellie, tied up somewhere near Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. Poor Charles Lindbergh hit the sky immediately in his airplane, searching along the Atlantic coast, and others, of course, helped him. But cruelly, in the end, the whole ransom negotiations handled by Condon were somehow a hoax, and no boat or baby was found. Tragically, something much worse came to light on May 12th, so we're talking more than two months after the little boy was kidnapped. A truck driver discovered the remains of Charles A. Lindbergh Jr., aged only 20 months, a few miles from the Lindbergh estate. So Darcy, how did the little tyke die? Um. At first of all, I think it was said before he was taken out of the house. That was my first impression. You, um, I you, think the nurse knew it. Would you repeat that uh, for me, Darcy? Sorry? I believe the child was dead before he was ever taken out of the house. Oh, wow. Okay. And the, the footsteps were a plant. Okay. Um, and I think the ransom note became a, a prevalent in to make it look more like a, a, a kidnapping than it was to... No one wanted to know if he was dead before he left the house. Right. And the gentleman in question, um, and I've just looked at picture 16, yep. but the man in question is the man they were looking at, and that's why I think it was partly an inside job too, is dark hair, um, rounder, like maybe a rounder face, dark eyes, but eyeballs. Um, I don't see him in a hat, but maybe he wore a hat at one time. Um, there's something prominent about him, but I'm not sure whether it's he's got a large nose, big ears, but there's something prominent okay. about him. Um, if the nurse didn't have an involvement in it, I'd be really shocked. And when you say the nurse, you mean Betty Gow, or do you think it was Violet Sharp? Betty. Betty. Okay, the one who was completely cleared of the investigation. Yeah, the one with the dull look. Yeah, the one with the dull, Uh, yeah, the headlights, right. uh, And the other girl, the one who I felt knew something but was afraid to come forward. Yep, Violet. Violet. I, I really feel like she saw something, knew something, but... Maybe there's something from her past that she didn't want to dig up, Mm -hmm. and that's why she didn't come forward, because most people who don't come forward have something in the first place to hide. Right. And um, there's definitely a man involved. And I think he was the one responsible for the idea behind the kidnapping. I just feel like when I'm, I'm in that bedroom, and when I look between 6 and 8.30... What I feel is that already, like, something happened. Uh, and maybe waiting till 10 o'clock was to give a little more time for getaway. I'm not sure. And I know I can possibly be wrong because my what I'm seeing is so far long gone that I could still pick it, be even picking up on the residue of what other people have said about this case. So when you say he's so far long gone, you don't mean he's so far long gone because he was dead. You mean he's so far long gone because he was out of the house. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, as I say, that's that's a fascinating theory, Darcy, because it's totally contrary to the main theory of this kidnapping. The main theory is that 
Someone went in between 8.30 and 10, climbed the ladder, went across, picked up the boy, came out, came down the ladder, somehow slipped down the ladder. The ladder broke. The child was dropped, hit his head, and died soon well, afterwards. That's the, that's the general theory today. Well, I still agree the child hit his head, and that's why he's dead. Okay. But I think it happened earlier, and whoever went up the ladder, they had to be. Given the, the expanse and the, the wooden ladder and everything, and the fact that they didn't, they didn't have ladders like we do where you can expand it, so they had to put one ladder on top of another to do this. Yeah, it's a handmade. That, yep. Yeah, that person would have had to be really light to go up that ladder and not make noise. And that is why I'm saying this child did not come down that ladder. Maybe they actually threw him out the window. It's supposedly to be caught by somebody, or he was thrown out the window yes. when he was dead? Yeah, well, they could have thrown him out the window thinking he was going to be caught by someone, and maybe they missed. Yeah, okay. But you had said earlier you thought the child was brought out through the house. Well, I still do. I, I mean, I'm just playing into the idea of what yep. other people say, but my instincts all say he came down a back staircase, handed off, they made the footprints, but... I also get the impression that child was already dead. Wow. So you think it was a bundled, bungled kidnap from the beginning, i.e. somehow they took the child, the child was damaged and maybe even dead. They took the child out of the house and they made up this uh, idea of taking him from the window, being kidnapped afterwards to cover their tracks. Yes. Wow. Okay. Well, that's, that's a... I like that theory. It's certainly interesting. And I, I would say there has to be an inside link, as you say, no matter what, even if they did go up and down the ladder. Somebody had to tell them the child was available for snatching at a certain time, that people wouldn't be standing and looking over his crib, that they'd be otherwise engaged, and that you could put your ladder up or sneak up the back steps or something. So I think it, you're right, there had to be an inside part of the, the job, and I don't know who the person is, but there had to be someone. Uh, I'm leaning towards the nurse. Betty Gow. Yes. Okay. And I also lean towards um, the lady that's like a little scary to look at. Okay, well, that's going to be a little twist that's going to hurt you there. <laughs> okay, so... Okay. For the rest of 1932, and most of the next year, 1933, police tracked locations where the gold notes were used, but to no avail. They couldn't get any information. But the big break finally came in the fall of 33, when a sharp-eyed bank teller spotted one of the Lindbergh ransom gold notes, because of course they're all recorded, and it had a New York license plate number scribbled along the side. The investigators assumed that the number had been scrawled on the note by a gas station attendant, and after tracking down the gas station, they went, of course, to many of them, they finally found the right gas station, learned that, yes, this note came from a customer who the gas station attendant described as an average-sized guy with a German accent and driving a blue Dodge. The next day, the FBI, but they're called the BI, and the police a uh, man with a, uh, arrested a man with a German accent while driving away from his home in a blue Dodge. This man matched the description Condon provided of Cemetery John, and they had his license plate. They were able to find where he lived, and they picked him up. So a search of this man's property turned up thirteen thousand eight hundred and sixty dollars in Lindbergh bills most of which were stuffed into an empty can of shellac. And if you look at photo number 17, Darcy, you'll see the actual can in which the, the notes were stuffed. Well, that was just a regular old, what used to be a jerry can. Exactly. Well, you have to say it's a place to fix notes. Yeah, you wouldn't think it'd be the first place you'd look. No, not at all. Okay, you well, now... On a shelf or under a kitchen counter or something. Exactly. Very nondescript, right? Yes. And very typical, so you're not going to go, oh, that's, a, that's an exciting-looking, unusual object. I mean, it's something that everybody would have had around. Yes. Okay, so now I'm going to put you to the second major test, Darcy. I'm going to show you, in no particular order, headshots of now four white men. All four, you'll find, are nattily dressed 
wearing suits and ties, which is typical of the 30s. Each man had a key role in the case, but only one was a convicted kidnapper. So have a look at photo number 18, if you will, of our first male, who, from my perspective, has a penchant for bow ties because he's wearing one. Can you describe this man, Darcy, to us and offer any ideas about him? Well, uh, older gentleman, um, looks like he's going gray, with back hair, um, uh, like you said, bow tie. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna say no. Okay, all right. Next photo is number 19. This male number nine, or male number two, he sports a white fedora, looking pretty natty, uh, and a, a big cigar. What do you think about him, Darcy? He reminds me of a gangster. He does, doesn't he? <laughs> Uh, um, okay, there's a maybe there. I'm, I'm not going to rule him out right now, but I think he's more like that dandy boy they used to call them. The, you know, Osho? No, explain that. Um, you know, we like to dress the part. We like to be something that we're truly not. Oh, okay. And when you say there's a lady there, what do you mean? There's no lady in the picture. Um... I don't know. I just feel like there's a lady around him. Oh, okay. Cool. All right. Moving on to our third male. Uh, this fellow has very interesting eyes. Very soulful okay. and deep, I think. What can you divine about him, Darcy? Uh, I don't know if I'd want to be in, um, in the dark with him. Like, <laughs> you know, in the alley. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think because he's got those soulful eyes, I think they sort of hide... A little bit more temper. Okay. Um, would you know if this guy's done any time? I'm not going to tell you just yet. Okay. Okay. And now we'll look at our last photo. And uh, this oh. fellow also has a distinguishing feature, I think, his eyes. But it might be just the way the photograph has been uh, somehow damaged. So his eyes look really bright. Um, yes. But that may or may not be, you know the way he really looked. But what can you tell about our guy number four, who's in photo number 21? Okay, um, one of these, that's number 20 and 21, uh -huh. they have, to me, a similar look. And uh, the eyes stand out, the ears stand out. Yep. The, the, the energy coming off of them. This guy, oh, I'm um, sort of putting money on him. Um... Oh, okay. Now I'm torn between 20 and 21. And when you say you're torn, you're saying you feel 20 and 21 might be the the guilty person I'm talking about? Yes, but you know the hat, the fedora off the one guy? Yep. Number 19. Mm -hmm. If I could put a hat on him, mm -hmm. on number 21, mm -hmm. I might have my man. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Well, I'll tell you who they really are. So. Okay. Number 20... Is one number, of them a lawyer? Sorry? Is one of them a lawyer? Uh, yes. Do you, can you uh, hazard a guess as to which one? No, oh, no, I'm going to go back to number 18. Um, okay, so 18 or 21. Okay, well, this is who they really were. So 18 is the police superintendent. He's named Norman Schwarzkopf. A man with an exceptional oh. military career, and you might have heard the name before because his son, Norman Schwarzkopf Jr., was a famous general in the Persian War, in the, the, the U.S.-Persian War, uh, in the, I think it was the 80s. Um, he was, this, this Schwarzkopf was supposed to be the lead investigator into the Lindbergh kidnapping, but in fact, as I mentioned earlier, much of the work was handled by Lindbergh himself. Number 19, our gentleman with the fedora hat, who looks a bit like a gangster, is actually the lawyer. He's the case prosecutor. His name is David Willens. Number, th uh, number 20, the fellow who you said, and I would totally agree with you, you wouldn't want to spend much time in a dark alley with. His name is Isidore Fisch, and he is a German native who returned back to Germany in later in 1933. And our last fellow, number four, is none other than Bruno Richard Hauptmann, the man accused of kidnapping and killing baby Charles Augustus Lindbergh in March 1932. So you were right about... 
him being possibly involved? Yes, he was involved. Well, technically, they're all involved in a different way. Exactly. Well, that's that's what I wanted to see, how you could divine their involvements. See, number 18, I wouldn't have thought he was in charge of the family, forgive me for this, of anything. Well, as I mentioned, I think you're probably quite right. Even though he was named the lead investigator, he was the police chief superintendent, uh, Charles Lindbergh himself handled pretty well everything so this individual had a very very tiny if no role at all except for his name was on the wanted poster oh, okay. as the person to contact uh, yeah I would have gone right through the father myself personally too yeah okay well I'm going to show you a photo number 23 of Bruno Hauptmann and it's actually four headshots of Bruno uh, the one I use is in the bottom right I'll tell you a little bit about him as you're looking at him. He was arrested on September 19th, 1934. So we're talking two years plus after the child was uh, kidnapped and then found dead. He had a $20 gold certificate from the ransom payment in his pocket. And it's photo number 23. We don't have photo number 22. I had to pull that one, Darcy. So what does photo number 23, the four headshots of Bruno, uh, tell you? Well, he seems very confident mm -hmm. about himself. Okay, a little on the arrogant side. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say, again, you're right, maybe it's the, uh, the trademark or image mark that's inside of it that really makes his hand his eyes stand out. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Yeah. It's almost like you get a picture into his soul, which is pretty empty. You're seeing nothing in his soul? No, no regret, no nothing. Wow. Do you see anything in, uh, have you in the past seen, in, in our discussions, have you seen something in people's souls of regret? I can see a little regret. I can see the anger. And with him, it's like everything's calculated. Ah, he does have a, that kind of cold look, doesn't he? Yes. Okay, well, he said, Bruno Hauptmann said, the money belonged to his friend, photo number 20, Isidore Fish. And that Isidore returned to the fatherland the previous Christmas, so that was in 1933 after the little child was kidnapped and then found dead. And he later died of tuberculosis. Bruno says he discovered the money that Isidore Fish had and he decided to spend it without telling his wife. He refused to confess to the kidnapping and killing of Baby Lindbergh. Okay, well, I will give him that uh, he didn't kill the baby, uh, but the kidnapping plot was his idea. Contrary to what he may say is his wife didn't know he spent the money. Yes, she did, because yes, she did. That's what I'm hearing. And... The idea that he could find that money in that jerry can is just beyond belief. <laughs> it is a bit much, isn't it? Yes. And he was a carpenter, as was Isidore Fish, and therefore quite capable of hand-making a ladder. Yes. But that, half, that ladder was jigged, rigged at the last minute. Yeah, you're saying the ladder was a ruse. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to take you to the, the woman that we have never identified to the next photo. Photo number 24 is actually Bruno's wife, Anna Hauptmann. Her maiden name is Schleffler. She believed her husband was innocent to the day she died at age 95 in 1994. So have a look at her again in photo number 24. What does she tell you now, Darcy? Okay. She may have taken to her grave the true knowledge of what occurred, and I know she was involved. Okay. How do you know that? Because she's hiding behind, and there's her eyes, the sadness in, inside of them. I don't think she was involved in that she took the child or anything. Okay. Okay. But she's involved in her knowledge. But I'm just looking... There is this feeling of, of regret here. Okay. So do you There's, think, was Bruno protecting her when he said she knew nothing about it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And she, of course, was protecting him by saying he was innocent. Yes. 
So, do you believe Bruno Hauptmann was guilty? Strangely enough, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'll tell you a little bit about the trial and what they determined. So the trial began on January 3rd, 1935, so now almost four years later. Of course, it was an international sensation, and both Charles and Anne Lindbergh testified. Have a look at photo number 20... Uh, wait, sorry, before we do that, I should let you look at no, from before photo number 25, sorry. Um, when Hauptmann was indicted for extortion and murder, he pleaded not guilty, and here is his mugshot. Can you get anything else from about Bruno from that mugshot number 25? Yeah, no, it's the same. Yeah, no. Okay. It's the same. Got Whenever it. he's hiding, he's hiding well. Yeah, he's got a very cold stare, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Okay, so now, sorry, we're moving on to the trial, uh, and we'll give you a look of actually of Charles Lindbergh himself walking towards the building in the trial. So he's in photo number 26. Now you see Charles, this is a few years after his son has been murdered. Uh, can you glean anything from that photograph? Well, um, obviously for me, there's a lot of anger around him. Uh -huh. But I know this is going to sound like a really strange question, but was he ever suspected? Well... I would imagine, frankly, that everybody is suspected at some point in time, and I'm sure the parents had to be ruled out, but I believe they were pretty well instantly ruled out, as far as I know. Okay. But he looks like, you know, someone who's finally going to see an answer. Like, that's what I see from him. Like, he's moving at such an angle that it's to find the answer. You're right. Well, he's walking into the courtroom to testify. Yeah. Okay, have a look at photo number 27. This is another photo with a lot of energy. It, even I can kind of see the energy. You can see it's a crush of people around Charles Lindbergh. He's at the dead center in the back as he's leaving the courtroom after testifying. Do you get any vibes off this photograph? Hmm. He's, it's not very... overwhelming. Isn't it? Yeah, like this crush of people pushing you not just out the door, but against the door. It looks to me almost like that. He's being completely taken over by people. Yeah, and surrounded. Like, uh, so the guy in front of him is almost like, you know, when you're trying to protect your child and you put them behind you and you, and you stand out your arm. Yeah. It just feels like he's being protected. Yeah, I think he is. I think the police are, or those men around him are trying to help him move through the crowd. And, of course, we can see the, head, the back of the heads and the actual back of flash. Uh, cubes of the reporters taking pictures of him. Yeah. They're almost on top of him. Yeah, it must have been a terrifying feeling. Unfortunately, though, he's taller than most of the people in the room, so he would still command that attention no matter what. Yes, he would. He was a very tall, lean, good-looking man, and he had a, a, obviously an, a, a very strong, uh, powerful bearing. You know, he was had almost an aristocratic look, and of course he was this famous guy, so he had a lot going for him. Yeah. Okay, now let's look at photo number 28, and this is Charles Lindbergh himself in the witness chair, and it's not a very fancy chair, is it? In 1930, no. he's actually testifying at the trial of Bruno Hauptmann. Okay. Um, yeah, nothing spectacular. I just feel like, you know, he's just giving the information as is. I'm not picking anything significant up here. Okay. I'm going to show you one last photo of Bruno Hauptmann, and I think... The facade is crumbling a little bit. I'll be interested to see what you think of it. Look at photo number 29 and tell me he isn't looking a little concerned. Well, if you look at it closely enough, it's like he's wearing a face mask because he's holding his chin. So people only see what he wants them to see. But yes, I would definitely think that he is beginning to realize, and he's angry here, yeah. that he's about to lose. Yeah. Well, actually, Darcy, he testified in his own defense. He was very nervous on the witness stand, and though he admitted he lied to police, he proclaimed his innocence of the kidnapping and the murder. Do you agree? I don't think he murdered the child. I think what happened to the child was an accident. But because, and I know he is somehow connected to the kidnapping portion or the ransom portion, but I actually think the death of the child was an accident. And when you say that, do you think it was an accident uh, 
in the process of a kidnapping or did for example the nurse you know shake the child or drop the child and then went into a panic and somehow dealt with it it could very likely have been like that yes okay it's interesting because i feels like the death was an accident wow what a shame eh yeah but i've seen other cases where people panic instead of saying up front what happened and back then really would anyone want to go to jail No. Well, in fact, I can tell you the murder trial of Bruno ended after five weeks with a guilty verdict and a sentence of death, ironically on Valentine's Day. Of course, there were usual appeals, but he was eventually executed in the electric chair on April 13th, 1936. So only one good thing, I guess you could say, came as a result of this tragedy, Darcy. The Lindbergh kidnapping case led the U.S. Congress to pass the Federal Kidnapping Act also known as the Lindbergh Law. This act made kidnapping a federal offense and allowed federal investigators the authority to pursue kidnappers across state jurisdictions. So they weren't able to do that before, so baby Lindbergh's death at least changed the law in the states to to help find kidnappers. Okay, now before we end this, Darcy, I thought you might enjoy seeing a couple of shots of the Lindberghs many, many years later. Have a look at photos 30 and 31. We'll see the couple in 1968 and 1973. Despite a number of other challenges in their lives, and they had a lot of challenges and a lot of difficulties, I'm very relieved to see that they appear to be happy together. The very fact after something that tragic that they stayed together is remarkable. Yep, and do you get still a sense of warmth between them? Yes, I do. And I would say that they did love each other. Oh, that's good. They they do look like they're together. You know, they do look close and warm and relaxed, even though they've had such a horrendous time. Well, somehow it seems to that they've appeared to have survived this horrific tragedy. Lindbergh himself died in 1974, and Anne lived a quarter of a century later. And I'm going to end our story with a quote from Anne's writing. As I said at the beginning, she was an author and a poet published in both forms. She said in her diary on the first anniversary of the kidnapping and death of her son, Charles III, this was later published in a little book called Locked Rooms and Open Doors. Anne wrote, The punctuation of anniversaries is terrible, like the closing of doors, one after another, between you and what you want to hold on to. Wow. Isn't that poignant? It is. Yeah. Okay. Well, Darcy, that is our baby Lindbergh kidnapping storyline. Thank you. Well, thank you. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Seeing Dead People. Whatever's going on in Darcy's head, I think is so cool and astonishing. We'd love to hear from you with questions for Darcy about her psychic process or suggestions for other mystifying situations you would like us to investigate. So please shoot us an email to info at radiosydney.ca with Seeing Dead People in the subject line. New episodes of Seeing Dead People will emerge on the first Saturday of every month and will also be available every Saturday night at 8 p.m. and Sunday morning at 10 a.m., both Pacific Standard Time. Seeing Dead People will also be available as a downloadable podcast online at radiosydney.ca for your convenience. Cool news! Seeing Dead People is now a podcast on YouTube. Just search for Nicola Furlong Mysteries and you will find three podcasts of videos dedicated to seeing dead people. One for our actual complete episodes, another for Darcy's fascinating answers to our listeners' questions about her psychic process, and a third with teasers highlighting each episode. Thanks so much for listening to Seeing Dead People. I really dig researching, writing, and communicating with Darcy and her otherworldly contacts. So until the next time, remember, Seeing Dead People is a blast with goosebumps guaranteed. This has been a program of Radio Sydney.